End time prophecy, today's message, end time prophecy and prophetic ministry, and that is end time prophets and prophetic ministry. We're in volume two, and volume two is restoring prophetic ministry to the church. The first one was about the office and the ministry of the prophet. That was volume one. And now we're talking about how God wants to restore prophetic ministry and just a proper prophetic ministry. There's a lot of pathetic ministry out there, but proper prophetic ministry in the body of Messiah. And so far we have learned that prophetic ministry resurges in the last days just prior to Messiah's coming. We also learned that we must not quench the spirit of prophecy and prophetic utterance but we must test the prophetic word to be sure it is from God. That was in 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, 19 through 21. And in our first teaching, we talked about the different types of prophetic anointings. That was out of 1 Corinthians 12 and 4 through 6. And, and, and we learned that, that, that as we studied, as we went back and we looked at all of the prophets of, of, of ancient times and the various flows of the spirit of prophecy, we learn that there are prophetic anointings out there that rose up to lead God's people, to serve as priests, to serve as judges, that that prophetic spirit of prophecy could bring dreams and visions even to those who were not prophets. Counsel, the other thing that they did was a counsel where they confronted leaders and another thing they did was they raised the dead. These are, these are all different anointings. Not all prophets or prophetic people are going to raise the dead, but some will. And on and on and on and on and on. Some prophets and prophetic ministers will have dreams and visions, and, but some won't. Dreams and visions just isn't part of the anointing or the, or the way that God's going to work through those individuals. Okay? So... Don't try to be like anybody else and don't look for something to happen. Just look for the Lord and then let him bring whatever he's going to bring and give you and then he'll open up that door to use you. Amen? Hallelujah. All right. Different types of prophecy. That was uh, next week. Different types of prophecy. We learned there was messianic prophecy, general historical prophecy, and end time Bible prophecy, all which have been written down and then there was personal prophecy, and that's what we're dealing with primarily in this volume of teaching. Then last week, we learned that there are different channels of prophecy. The spirit of prophecy, the gift of prophecy, office of the prophet, prophetic presbytery, dreams, vision, trances, and prophetic preaching. Those are all channels that prophetic ministry and prophetic words can come through, whether it's being ministered by a prophet or a prophetic minister who's not a prophet. Because remember, we can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all may be edified, but all are not prophets. Amen? And that's why we have to understand the voice of prophecy, which is what we're going to talk about today. So that we hear properly and then we minister it properly. The voice of prophecy, the, the scripture verse that I always use for this is in Exodus 20 and verse 22. Because God has always wanted to speak directly to his people. Amen. He, he goes through prophets and prophetic ministers and, and, and all different types of ministry that can sow into our life. But what he really, really desires is what he's always desired from, from the, uh, from the um, plains of Sinai at Sinai when he spoke the commandments directly to Israel. And they said, no, Moses, you speak to us, lest we die. They didn't reject God's word. They rejected the voice of God's word that he was trying to write his Torah on their heart. But then God restored that to where people could hear it for themselves on Acts chapter 2 when he poured out his spirit and they began to speak with other tongues and prophesy. And it's in the last days that God restores that and there's a resurgence of it. And there's been a lot of hokey uh, prophetic ministry out there, but God wants to bring us back to a balanced Torah-based approach to that. 
Exodus 20, verse 22 says, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, You yourselves have seen that I have spoken to you from heaven. God's voice is heard in his word. The first aspect of God's word is the Logos word, and there are two manifestations of the Logos. The first one is that it's the mind of God in written form. For, uh, 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Be diligent to present yourself to prove to God a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word or the Logos of truth talking about studying the written word and rightly dividing it. Psalms 40 and verse 7 says, Then I said, Behold, I come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. And we see here that the Logos now, the book that's written of who? Yeshua, right? It goes from being written word to the living word. That's the transition. The written word reveals the living word, who is Yeshua. That brings us to number two, the second manifestation of the Logos, and that is the mind of God in human form. John 1, verse 1 and 14, everybody knows it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word for dwelt in the Greek also means tabernacle, like a tent. And tabernacle among us. Oh, we got the Feast of Tabernacles to come in. Yeah, because he's about ready to come back and tabernacle with us again. Yeah, that's what it's all about. The Word became flesh and tabernacle among us, and we saw His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Hallelujah. He is the living Logos. Revelation 19, when He comes back. See, when He was here, He was the living Word, Logos of God. He ascended as the living Word of God. But guess what? In Revelation 19, He comes back. And in verse 13, it says that he is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called what? The Word of God, the Logos of God, the living Word. Hallelujah. You know, during praise and worship today, Deb, I, um, there was just this sense. When we, when we sang that song, I can only imagine... That song always really gets to me because, but today, for whatever reason, it was especially meaning because that, that song that I can only imagine what it's going to be like when we're standing before you. Am I going to, am I going to sing hallelujah or be still? Am I going to stand or fall on, on the floor? What am I going to do? Because in that day, we have to understand that he is God. I mean, for whatever reason, there was like this new depth of understanding that He is God. And He doesn't care what anybody else thinks. He wants to minister to us and He wants to bring us over to think like Him. But in the end, He doesn't care what we think. He only cares about fulfilling His word in us, amen, his Torah, his teaching, his instruction, his ways, and his understanding in us, his people, and that's because he loves us, but he's like, he was clothed, he was clothed, clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the word of God, Colossians 1 and verse 15 says, he is the image, Yeshua is the image of the invisible God, the invisible Yahweh, the firstborn of all creation. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. You know, scientists have never, ever, ever been able to figure out what keeps the neutrons and the protons that are spinning around the atom intact right here. I know what it is. In him, all things hold together. He holds the universe together. That's why he can rearrange it anytime he wants. It's called the supernatural. Yeah. Hebrews 1, verse 3. 
and he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made perfection of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Hallelujah. Yeshua is the exact representation of the nature of Yahweh. That's because he is Yahweh in the flesh. Okay? That means that he's creative, self-fulfilling, powerful, true, inerrant, infallible, complete, life-giving, trustworthy, and sure. In other words, all prophetic ministry... And when prophetic utterances come forth, they must maintain God's nature and his character. Amen? It's not going to deviate, or it's not a prophetic word. It's a pathetic word. And that's why we have to know God. We have to know him by his word, which is the, which is the revelation of truth, and by his spirit, spirit and truth. The word here is sure. He is sure. Is that right? And that goes back to 2 Peter 1, verse 19. So we have the prophetic word made more what? Sure. To which we do well to pay attention. The King James uh, Version says we have, the prof we have the sure word of prophecy. And remember, prophecy is the testimony of Yeshua. And if his nature and his character is sure, guess what? God's prophetic word is going to be a sure word. Now we do well to pay attention to it. As a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in our hearts. That has not happened yet. The morning star has started, but it hasn't fully manifested. And it doesn't until the book of Revelation. I don't have time to go there and read that, but it's all tied together and God gives us a timing on everything. Then there's the rhema word. The rhema word is the mind of God in quickened form. It is a Holy Spirit inspired word from the word that brings life, power, and faith. And I might add, faith to walk it out and live it in our lives. Ecclesia or excuse me, Ephesians 6 and verse 11 says and and I I touched on this when we did the spiritual when we did the uh, spiritual warfare series about how in in Ephesians 6 beginning in verse 11 it says put on the full armor of God that so that you are able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. And we went through all of that armor and we learned that the bottom line of all of that was, was that that armor, everything related back to the word of God. Amen? And verse 17, the last piece of armor, it says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the what? Rhema of God. The revelation of God that's quickened to us. We cannot fight a fight if we don't have the revelation. And we can't fight the fight based on somebody else's revelation. Is that right? Oh, man. And I, <clears throat> and I know a lot of people, people will say, man, your teaching is just so great. We love it so much and so on and so forth. And I always tell you and I will continue to tell you, don't go by my revelation. If God's not revealing what I'm sharing with you to you by revelation by His Spirit, you can't walk in it because it's got to be revealed by the Spirit and written on your heart. Amen? Hallelujah. That's why I search the Scriptures and study and pray and so on and so forth. My whole my whole ministry is, is geared toward bringing the revelation of Yeshua the Messiah to his people. That is just the calling on my life. And, and I want you to know, I, that's, that's really all I do all day. Sometimes I think my wife, would, <laughs> my wife is back there, hey man. Yeah, sometimes I think and she's saying, Norm, you need to do more stuff. <laughs> I got more stuff around here for you to do. I try to do my honeydews when I can, honey, you know me. But... 
my wife is very capable and she loves doing stuff like that. She's a great helpmate. Hallelujah. Luke 4 and verse 4 says, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every rhema, every revelatory word from the word, from the Logos, that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And that doesn't mean it has to be spoken. That means that when you're reading the word, guess what? God speaks to you by his spirit and reveals things to you. And there's sometimes we're reading the word and something, well, we get a revelation, but please hear me, not all revelations are from the Lord. That's why we go back and we check it out. That's why we need to have somebody that we're accountable to, so that, that seasoned, that knows the word of God, that we can talk to them and see if that makes sense. Because, you know, sometimes we're listening to our own spirit and our own imaginations, our own emotional uh, approach to things and so on and so forth. And so there are checks and balances based on God's word, but also based on those that we are accountable to for what we, for what we teach and preach and prophesy. Prophecy. Prophecy is that third form of word from God. And prophecy is the mind of God in verbal form where it gets spoken. We have Logos prophecies. Prophecies, Logos prophecies, are, are inspired prophecy from the Logos. In other words, we minister and the, and, the, and the word of the Lord comes and it rises up inside of us and says, speak out whatever passage of Scripture. And so we speak it out. That's a Logos prophecy, but we have to be careful because sometimes people will prophesy Logos prophecies out of their flesh. I've had that happen a couple of times. I've shared, I've shared with one instance where, not to me so much, but, but somebody in, in the congregation, when I was pastoring in Fort Collins, um, there was a there was a prophetic flow and people were flowing from one side of the room to the other and they were prophesying and people were getting touched and ministered to and weeping and repenting and just it was just a um, it was a powerful dynamic time in the Lord and this one young prophetic guy in the back is going my turn I know and I and I said okay because the Lord was telling me you're going to have to correct him so have him go last and so, and so when everybody got done and that flow kind of settled down, um, he stood up and, and uh, he prophesied and he prophesied a word of judgment. Uh, and it, but it was from the Logos. So it was valid Logos, but it wasn't a valid prophecy. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? And that prophecy went right on the floor. And so I said... I called him up front, and I, I put my arm around him, and I said, now, does everybody understand that that prophecy was not the Lord? And everybody's going, yeah, we understand. And so I explained to them what happened, and the, but I also explained to him and to them what happened, and I said, but now, listen, sometimes people make mistakes when it comes to stuff like that. And so you, you love this man and so on and so forth. And we want to encourage him to do it right. And he's never did that again, at least not in my congregation. And I've only had one other time. And it was at a different, same church, different location. And a, and a woman stood up and she did the same basic thing. And I just, when everybody was done prophesying, I just said, well... I said, I'm, I don't believe that was from the Lord, and here's why. And I explained why. And she was just as upset. She was as mad as a wet hen. And she never came back. And you guys know me. I, that's fine. Don't come back. I don't want you back. I'm not into building numbers. I'm into building God's people up in Him. In fact, I just soon have you leave. Because I don't want that spirit in the church. Does that make sense? 
Yeah. Sometimes a good house cleaning in a church is a good thing. <laughs> so when they prophesy a Logos prophecy, but they do it out of their flesh, I always say it's more perspiration than inspiration. And then see, even Logos prophecies are for edification, exhortation, and comfort. Remember, we talked about that last week. Prophecies that are being prophesied out of the Logos are for edification, for exhortation, and for comfort, unless it's somebody that flows in the, a recognized somebody that flows in the office of the prophet. That's who can bring any, some sort of a judgment or a correction or, or, or some other thing other than just edification, exhortation, and comfort. And we, we talked about that last week. Then there's rhema prophecy. Rhema prophecy is when God reveals his thoughts and intents for a person to another person to share with them or to a congregation to give a public prophecy, but we're talking about personal prophecy at this point. It usually comes in first person. Thus says the Lord, I will do this and I will do that. I'll talk more about that here in a minute. It must stay in the boundaries of Scripture. In other words, it can't be some new revelation that goes that, that is not in Scripture. You can't find it in Scripture or goes against Scripture. And it must maintain the character and the nature of God. That's why keeping those types of prophecies to edification, exhortation, and comfort is, I believe, when Paul shared that with us, God was just saying, here's how you stay out of trouble. Edification, exhortation, and comfort. Personal prophetic ministry can contain words of knowledge. Words of knowledge are when God reveals a situation or knowledge about an individual, where they're at, what they need, etc., etc. And so they've got that. And then, or a word of wisdom. And that is when, when you're, when you're, and you, you don't know this person or whatever, and you say, the Lord has a word for you, and you give them the word, and it's a word of wisdom that just unlocks answers questions that they have, and so on and so forth. Rhema prophecies generally speak forth the person's potential. That's why when we pray the, the blessing over the husbands and wives, <laughs> and, and I read the blessing over Deborah and how she is all these things, and she'll stop and she'll say, now just remember, this is prophetic. <laughs> this is still in process. How many of you understand what I'm saying? See, God is he's interested in revealing his plan and his potential, and his purpose for our lives. So he will have someone speak that forth. And I know, and I, I remember when <clears throat> I got a prophetic word saying that I was going to, and this is when I was, I was struggling as a minister. It was, I, had, I got wiped out in the 87 stock market crash. And I went to a prophet's conference, and I just, I didn't, I was looking for answers and direction from God. I'd been three years on the backside of the desert, um, and, and couldn't make my house payment. I mean, on and on and on. And so I went to this conference, and I, and, and I got this word, and this word was that I've called you into prophetic ministry, and I'm going to send you to the nations. Your foot is going to tread on every continent, and so on and so forth. And I just have to tell you, I'm sitting there going, yeah, right. <laughs> I can't even make my house payment. <laughs> but you want to know what? Six months after that, I got a job. And all I did was travel. And I got to minister the word of the Lord. And it was through that job that, I've, that, I, got my, that, that I got my debt paid off. Does everybody understand? And so sometimes when you hear a prophecy over somebody that's just a real rascal and you're going, yeah, right. You need to pray into that and pray that that manifests in their life. And you say, well, how do we make that come to pass? We're going to talk about that in, in a later session. 
how to, how to receive and how to walk a prophecy out. Because most people whose, whose prophetic words don't come to pass, it doesn't come to pass or hasn't come to pass yet is because they're not walking in it and, and interpreting it, receiving it, and then walking, out, walking it out properly. And I don't have time to go there because we're running out of time. All personal prophecy, and I shared this and I've shared this a couple times before, all personal prophecy is conditional whether conditions are stated or not. And we know that because prophecies can fail. A really good example, God's word direct from the Lord's mouth. And, I, and, I've, and I've talked about this before. I haven't used this passage of scripture. I use the prophecy that God gave, uh, that, had, that God had Moses give to the children of Israel the seven I wills. And the seventh I will was that he was going to bring them, that generation, into the land but they did not enter in because, Hebrews 3 and 4 says, because of lack of faith and disobedience. They couldn't enter into the land, so they wandered 40 years in the wilderness. Was Moses a false prophet? No. Same thing with Jonah. He walks up and down the streets of Nineveh, and he declares, yet in 40 days Nineveh will be torn down. The people repented. Guess what? God didn't judge. And he explains that through Jeremiah in Jeremiah 18, beginning in verse 7. He says this. At one moment I might speak, again, here's a verbal word, concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to uproot, to pull down, or to destroy. Destroy it. That would be Nineveh. If that nation against which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent concerning the calamity I plan to bring on it. So the prophecy to destroy coming from God's word, God says, if they repent, I, I can and I will not bring the judgment. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? Verse 9. Or at another moment, I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to build up or to plant. I believe that was Israel. I believe it was the United States. If it does evil in my sight, however, by not obeying my voice, then I will think better of the good with which I had promised to bless it. And I just want to, I just want to tell you categorically, folks, is that the United States was blessed by the Lord. He spoke that he wanted to bless it, that he wanted to use it for his purposes in the earth. But the United States has begun, the people of the United States has be, have begun to walk away. And so we've gone through several curses, times of cursing. And there's another one that's coming up not too far down the road. And I don't have time to go into that. I'll, I'll go into it later as the Lord gives me more of an understanding and insight. Into that, I'll do a, uh, just take a teaching one day and I'll just do kind of a prophetic update and here's what's going on and here's what to expect. And he's already shown me some stuff, but I'm, I'm, I'm not ready to share that yet. All I can say is be prepared because it can happen any time. And no, <laughs> Mary, <laughs> Planet X is not going to hit and I know you know this because you were making fun of you know, people who say that. There's a, there's a word going around that planet X is going to hit, you know, hit, hit or is going to have a, some sort of effect on the United States or on the world uh, on the 23rd. That's like what next Shabbat. And um, <clears throat> although if it was going to happen, it happening in... In the time of the 10 days of awe would be a time for that to happen, but it's not going to happen. First of all, there is no planet X. There's no 10th planet. There's nothing in Scripture about it. There's nothing in Scripture, and, and they have, and I've seen graphics, and this was all, in fact, this was supposed to happen in 2012, they were saying. Okay, all these things are going to happen in 2012, and I debunked that whole thing and said, there's not going to happen. Here's what could happen. 
And there were some things that, yeah, could happen. And there were some things that just were not going to happen. And I stated categorically, these are not going to happen. Now or ever. And planet X, and X stands is Roman numeral 10. It's planet 10. It's supposed to be our 10th planet in our solar system. The bottom line is, is that there's all kinds of stuff like that going out, and it's just not going to happen. But the bottom line is, is that, is that if, a, if a nation has been promised a blessing of the Lord, they're following the Lord. He's using them. He planted them. He raised them up. They're walking in his commandments and so on and so forth. But then if they turn from those commandments, he'll say, oh, sorry, I'm going to relent on that. I'm not going to bless it like I said I was going to because of their sin. The wages of sin is death. I don't care who you are. God's voice is heard in his word. Amen. The Logos prophecies and the Rhema prophecies. Let's take a look. You got the written word and you got a personal word from the word. Logos prophecy would be general prophecies. Rhema prophecies are personal prophecies. Logos prophecies would, are the same for eternity. They don't change because they come from the Logos. Personal prophecies are for a time and a season. Please hear me. And I, I, I may or may not have time to go into this when I talk about the way of prophecy next week. <clears throat> I have so much to cover next week. Pray for me. Is that, is that there are sometimes a prophecy is given and we don't walk it out properly or whatever. And we must understand that sometimes those prophecies... They just, they just, the season is passed for it. It's not going to be fulfilled because too many things have happened for it to be fulfilled. So God is going to do something else or bring something else and so on and so forth. No matter, and, and I want to say this as an encouragement, no matter how bad you miss it, no matter how bad we miss it, is that from that point on, God still has a perfect will for your life. And it's to bring you into the fullness of his glory. It just may not be exactly the way that he had planned before you disobeyed or the season went past or whatever the case may be. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? So all I can say is this. Don't live in the past. Live in the now as God speaks to you and shows you. And if there's a change and there's a change in the wind and it's evident. Don't get locked into something in the past that, you, that, that, that the Lord was doing that may have gone past the time for its fulfillment. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? And, and I'm going to get into that when I get into how to receive personal prophecy and walk it out. All right, let's keep going. Unconditional prophecies or Logos prophecies because they come from the Word of God, which is eternal and it doesn't change. Rhema prophecies are conditional prophecies. Logos prophecies are unfailing and unchangeable. In other words, prophecy that's in the Bible, written in the Bible, is not going to change. It is the way that is written. It is written, thus says the Lord. That means it's going to happen. Personal prophecy can fail or be changed. That's what I've been talking about. <clears throat> Logos prophecies reveal the wis is the wisdom of God, and Rhema prophecies can bring a word of wisdom. In other words, remember the Torah of God is our wisdom, is what is what the Lord told Moses. But we have to understand personal prophecies can bring bring a word of wisdom. In fact, when somebody, a lot of times people will get a word of knowledge and they just automatically speak it forth. They prophesy it. Sometimes God doesn't want you to do that. I'll get into that here in a minute. Logos prophecies reveal the knowledge of God. Rhema prophecies will bring a word of knowledge. And so on and so forth. So there's a difference. Does everybody understand that? I hope you do. If you don't, Send me a question, and I'll, and I'll try to get more into it next week on the question and answers. Logos prophecies are like a piano, like our piano over here. 
A rhema prophecy is like one, one note sounding forth from the piano. Logos prophecies is like the ocean. Rhema prophecies are one wave of the ocean. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? Logos prophecies are, are like a sandy shore. Rhema prophecies are like one scoop of sand from that shore. Logos prophecies are like a school of fish, obviously. Rhema prophecies are like one fish. Logos prophecies are like a well of water, and Rhema prophecies are like one bucket of the well. Logos prophecies are like a grapevine, and Rhema prophecies, obviously, are one grape from that vine. Yeah. One bottle versus one glass. And on and on and on and on and on. <clears throat> Hearing God's rhema for ourselves. This is really key because everybody wants to hear God's personal word for them. Plus, if we have a heart to minister to others, we want to hear God's personal word for the people and the person that we're ministering to. And Michael talked about that a little bit uh, today in his teaching on Torah. The bottom line is we are called to minister God's word in the earth to whoever God puts in front of us and he says, I want you to minister to this person. God reveals his rhema when we read his logos. That's one of the, one of the ways, and I touched on that earlier. We hear God's rhema when the Logos is preached. Romans 10, beginning in verse 14. How then will they call upon him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? So faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing by the rhema of Messiah, the rhema of God, the rhema of Christ. I don't know about you, but when I, heard, when I heard the first time, when I heard it with my, with my heart, I heard it with my head a number of times, but when I heard it in my heart, with the, with the ears of my heart and my soul, I, I just want to tell you, it was like, ah, oh, I have faith. And I said, yes, Lord. Save me and deliver me and I'll serve you. And he did. And that was 37 years ago. Wow, I'm old. <laughs> I just love the Lord, folks. We hear God's rhema by the Spirit. A spirit witness is what we call it. That's number three. For all who are being led, this is Romans 10, verse 14, for all who are being led by the Spirit, these are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of slavery, again to fear again, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Now listen to this. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And that's what happens when you get born again, when you accept Jesus, and it's real and it's in your life. The Holy Spirit comes and bears witness with your spirit. And you know that you know that you know that you're saved. Let's look at how we distinguish God's voice from Satan's voice, from our soul, and from our flesh. How many of you know they will all speak to us? Sometimes at the same time and in unison. God's voice versus Satan's voice. God's voice comes from within your, in your spirit, man. Satan's voice or the voice of your soul or the soul realm comes from like outside. Comes from up here rather than coming up from inside. God's voice is a small, quiet, peaceful voice, generally. How many of you know when Paul, on, on the way to Damascus, 
God's voice was not small, gentle, or peaceful, or quiet. It knocked him right off his donkey. A booming. Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? Yeah. So, so the Holy Spirit is not always a gentleman. I know some people have said that and teach that and so on, but he's not always a gentleman. Sometimes if you need to get knocked on your rear end, he will do it so that you will hear him. That's just the way that he works. And he does it out of love. But when it comes from a personal prophecy, it's for edification, exhortation, and comfort. It's going to be a small, quiet, peaceful voice that ministers life to you. Satan's voice, the voice of a soul realm prophecy or a flesh prophecy, is loud and it's clamoring, and it doesn't bring that peace. God's voice does it generally through gentle leadings. There's leadings of the Holy Spirit. Satan's voice, our soul or our flesh's voice, is pushy and demanding action. God's voice convicts of sin. It doesn't condemn us, it convicts us. Huh. That doesn't make sense. What 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 Satan's voice does or what our what our soul realm or whatever it condemns us. In other words, in other words it says well, you did this and there's no hope for you and it's all over and blah blah blah. God's voice convicts us of sin and says come now, let us reason together, repent and come back to me and I'll restore you. That's the difference. Okay? Godly, God's voice brings forth godly, logos-based truth. Satan's voice, our soul and or our flesh, brings forth lies, deceits, and a lot of times it does it in a truth-air mixture. Okay, that's the most dangerous. God's voice is patient. Satan's voice, our flesh, our soul, so on and so forth, is very impatient. Doesn't have time for this or that or whatever the case may be. When God wants to do something and just settle things down and minister, there's an impatience when that prophetic word comes. You've got to do it now. There's a sense that things are under control and ordered with understanding with God's voice. With the voice of the flesh or the voice of, of Lucifer, there's a sense of things that are out of control, disordered with confusion. God's voice leaves you feeling free, refreshed, answers, so on and so forth. Satan's voice and the voice of the flesh leaves you feeling bound up maybe more fearful, unknowing than you were before you got the prophecy. I've seen that happen. God's voice speaks while we are seeking God. Satan's voice and the voice of the flesh usually speak suddenly intrusive thoughts. They just, you can be, you can be sitting there doing something and boom, this thought comes in and it is the most horrible thought that you think, man, I'm saved. How can that thought come into me? That's not. That's from the enemy, or from your flesh. And what do we do with those? We take those thoughts, what, captive, and we tear them down as part of our spiritual warfare, and we bring it into obedience to Yeshua the Messiah, the Living Word. Amen. That's what we do. We say, no, I'm not going to give in to that thought. I'm not going to give myself to imaginations. I'm That is a lie from the pit, or that's a lie from my flesh. I'm not going to give in to that. We take it captive. God's voice is positive toward the Logos word. Satan's voice and the voice of the flesh is always negative toward the word of God, the Torah of God. Yeah. Hearing and ministering personal prophecy to others. 
Why does God, and the question is, why does God speak to us concerning others, and what do we do when he does? Well, the reason he speaks to us is so that we can pray prophetically for them at that time and or intercede for them later. Because God doesn't necessarily always want us to give them a thus says the Lord type of thing. Does everybody understand? He does it so that we know how to interact with them. In other words, how involved do I get with this person? And or how far do I let them into my personal circle? Or do I just need to stay away from this person? And I've shared this before, is that I shook, a hand, I shook hands with a guy one time in church. I got introduced to him. He was another financial guy. And the minute, the minute our hands met and we gripped, the Lord said, don't get yoked with him. Don't get yoked with him. In other words, don't partner with him. Don't, you know. And it ended up where he became a good friend and he recruited me and I actually went to work for him. And I thought, and, and, and I knew, I know that that was the Lord. He was doing that. He was showing me different things and so on and so forth. And then after the 87 stock market crash, the companies, the, there were three companies, three sister corporations, I was president of one of them, were having some real issues. My company was doing okay, and we were actually raising money for, for a project that we wanted to do. But the chairman of the board in the holding company was taking money from my company that I was president of and putting it over in another company that was really struggling because of the collapse of the stock market. And when I found that out, I went in and I sat down and I said, I said, we can't do that. And he offered me his half of the company that I was president of. Guess who the other half was owned by? the guy that the Lord told me not to get yoked with. He's going to give me the company. And I said, well, and I already knew what the answer was. I mean, immediately the Lord reminded me, don't get yoked with him. That was a prophetic word. And I didn't prophesy. Thus says the Lord, I'm not supposed to get yoked to you with you. That was for me. It was a prophetic word. Don't get yoked with him. Because if I had, and I just told him, nah, I'm not interested. Because if I'd accepted that, I would have been yoked with him. I'd probably be in jail today. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Thank God for the prophetic word. Amen? Hallelujah. I just love God. Another reason is so that we can counsel them according to God's will. Sometimes God will just reveal something to you, what's going on. That's a word of knowledge. And then he'll, then he'll reveal, this is what I want for them. And so you can kind of counsel them along that way. You have to be careful not to come across as trying to tell them what to do or manipulate them. And that just takes experience and knowledge of certain things. And then you counsel them and just kind of, you know, gently maybe guide them the way that the Lord is showing you that they need to go. And if they don't go that way, don't force it. Unless the Lord just says, well, I really believe you need to do this and then, and then leave it with them. Don't try to, don't try to force it on them. <clears throat> Another reason is so that we can speak the prophetic word to them for edification, exhortation, and comfort. In other words, we can prophesy, the Lord is showing me this. And we have to be very careful about saying, thus says the Lord. Be very reverent about that. I believe, you know, you can say things like, well, I believe the Lord is showing me this, or I believe God is showing me this. I believe the Lord is saying. Um, here's what I, I feel like the Lord is saying. You know, just kind of in my spirit, I have this for you. And then minister to him that way. If you want to say the Lord says this, that's fine. But just be very reverent about that one. Does that make sense? I'd rather be on the cautious side than get out there and shoot myself in the foot. Be sure your motives are right. Why are you ministering to someone? Proverbs 16, 2. 
All the ways of a man are clean in his own sight, but the Lord weighs the motives. Love must be the primary motive. 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, that's how we know speaking in tongues is a heavenly language, but do not have love, I am... I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, oh, whew, I'm prophesying. And now all, and know all mysteries and all knowledge. And if I have all faith, these are all gifts of the Holy Spirit, so as to remove mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. So love needs to be, when you're ministering prophetically, love needs to be the overriding motivation of everything. God's love for that person that you're ministering to. You're not there to tell them what to do. You're there to give them a word from the Lord that will bless them, edify them, encourage them, and comfort them. Wrong motives primarily focus on self-image. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. And a lot of people that have the gift of prophecy will function and flow because they're trying to they have the self-image thing that they want to be seen as. The question is, do you just want to be known as a minister or do you truly want to minister God's truth? Do you just want to be seen and admired as a servant of God or do you truly want to serve? And this goes for anybody in ministry, but especially in prophetic ministry. And then here's the biggest one. Do you want to be seen as a dynamic prophet of God or prophesier of God so you can be praised and receive a big offering? Or do, or, or do you want to minister God's love, comfort, and guidance. It's like, it's like for example, I, I, sh I shared this, and this is, was the crossroads of my life, and I'm just going to share it again because it's so true. It's just so real. So I, I administered prophetically at a church one year, went back the next year, preached the word, stepped out to minister prophetically, and the Lord is like, I'm not doing that today. And I'm like, and I'm asking, I'm Lord, I, I have to. I'm, that's why I'm here. That's one of the main, I mean, they like the word I minister, but they like the prophetic word the best, especially after the last meeting. Big offering, I mean, wonderful. You know, just everything a prophetic minister could want. And he said, I'm not doing that today. And my ministry, maybe even my life, who knows, was at a crossroads. I was either going to serve the gift so they could admire me as a prophet and get a big offering, or I was gonna, I was gonna serve the Lord with the gift that He gave me. And I stepped back and I just told Him, I don't have any specific words, but I'm gonna, I'll pray for people. If you want to come up, I'll pray, and if God gives me something, I'll give it to you. Because <coughs> it, it started to become a show, where you go in and you. And you minister the word, and then, you, and then you step out and you start to prophesy. And people go, ooh, ah, ooh. And the bottom line is, folks, that's not what God wants from his prophets or from his prophetic people. And he has brought a lot of that to a screeching halt in a lot of ministers' lives. And there's going to be more of that in the days ahead. Remember the prophets, the false prophets in Matthew 7? They're going to say to him on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? And didn't we cast out demons? And didn't we do miracles? And he's going to say, get away from me, you workers of a lawlessness. Because I never knew you. Lawlessness just means they, they were without Torah. They weren't functioning and flowing in God's Torah. They were prophesying. Prophets going in and prophesying and having all this, you know, the, all this admiration and so on and so forth. Casting out demons, doing miracles in Jesus' name. Jesus says, hey, that was all about your self-image. Get away from me. Depart from me. I never knew you. Wow. Can you imagine? I can only imagine what that would be like. You talk about heartbreak. Talk about fear. 
coming upon you. We've got to go back to the 10 M's of prophets and prophetic ministry. Remember we did that in the, in the, in the uh, prophets uh, teaching? Manhood, ministry, message, maturity, marriage, methods, manners, money, morality, and motive. Those all have to be in line in order for us to be as effective as possible for the Lord. And I'm not saying you have to be perfect. I'm just saying that those things need to be in line if you want to flow prophetically in spirit and truth, okay? Twelve keys to prophesying properly. I'm going to go through them real quick. Have a clear conscience. In other words, don't be walking in sin so that your conscience is all messed up. Build up your mind in God's Word. Study, read, meditate, and so on. Build up your spirit by praying in the Spirit, and that means praying in tongues. Although I pray in the language of men and of angels, we pray in both. Remember the purpose of personal prophecy. What is it? For what? Edification, exhortation, and comfort. That's the main reason for personal prophecy. Concentrate on and yield yourself to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Listen for the words of the, of the Holy Spirit. Make sure it's prophecy and not your own feelings, not your own opinions, your own doctrines, or judgments in your heart. I've heard people give a prophecy where they're just preaching their doctrine in the prophecy. I just got to tell you, that's just, not, that's just not the Lord. That's us. God's not going to honor it, nor will he bless it. Unabashed worship creates an atmosphere of prophetic ministry. Remember when... Samuel told Saul, go over there, you're going to meet a, a bunch of prophets coming down from the mountain and you'll go in the midst of them and you'll prophesy with them and you'll, be, and, you're, and you'll be changed into another man. Well, they were coming down the mountain singing and dancing and, and ministering to the Lord with music. Saul walks over there, walks in the midst of it, begins to prophesy with them. And he was changed into another man because prophecy can do that. Speak clear and loud enough so people can hear, or the people that need to hear it can hear it. Okay, don't speak it too loud. If people over here are doing something and they're not supposed to hear or they don't need to hear, but the people that are, that are, that are there and you're ministering to them, make sure that everybody can hear it. Use your own language, not 16th century King James English. These and thous and thuts and shalls and wherefores and blah, blah, blah. Check questionable content with leadership before you give it. There are some churches that will just tell you, if you've got a prophecy, you come up and you talk to the pastor, you tell him, here's the prophetic word I have, and he'll release you to give it or not. Here, where we're at, I don't have a problem with anybody here because everybody that prophesies here generally is right on target. I can't think of, you know, I can't think of any time that we haven't when we've gotten that prophetic word. And if it does come and it's incorrect, I, it, depending on how bad it is, uh, if it's really bad, I'll correct it right there in front of everybody. And if not, I'll just pull them aside later on, speak to them and Share with them and so on and so forth. Number 10, quit when the prophetic flow stops. Don't keep going. A lot of times there'll be a prophetic word that'll come and it'll just be, and it's so life-giving when it gets up to this point and then, the, and then whoever's ministering sometimes will say, well, yeah, well, this, this, will, this sounds like it'll go good with that. So they add to it and, and the prophet, sometimes it can ruin the whole thing. Give the word and then shut up. And don't try to interpret the prophecy you give. 
Don't try to interpret for the person. Just give them the word and be quiet. It's not to you. It's not based on your understanding. It's based on the person that's getting prophesied to. Does that make sense? Even if you know what it's for, you don't try to interpret it for them. They have to get that revelation, that rhema for themselves. How many of you still love me? Okay, praise the Lord. Thank you. Look for confirmation from others. In other words, if you give a prophetic word, when you're done with it, be quiet and let other people, if they, and, and how many times, and I know that we've done that here, is that if somebody's getting a prophetic word, when that prophetic word comes forward, another person will say, the Lord was just telling me the same thing. And he adds this, and so he builds on that. Sometimes you can build off one another. Does everybody understand? That's how, that's how prophetic ministry flows sometimes. So if that happens and there's a confirmation, you've got another witness there that God was speaking the same thing for that person to them. And then they minister it. So it's a confirmation. Ah, I need you up here, Deb. Let the Lord nudge you. See, you don't have to be perfect to give a prophetic word. Some people don't give prophetic words because they think that, oh, I'm just not good enough, I can't do that, and so on and so forth. And let the Lord nudge you with the Lamed of His Spirit, okay? And that's the letter, the Hebrew letter, Lamed. And here we have a Lamed, okay? And the Hebrew letter Lamed is a word, has a word picture associated with it, and it means a staff urging forward. As in a cattle, not a cattle prod, but a cattle goad, or even pushing forward, as in teaching or the tongue. In other words, it's a, it's a goading forward. And so I had my wife come up here because she does a good job at that. <laughs> I told her I wanted her to come up and do that and told her what I wanted her to do. She said, oh yeah, I can do that. <laughs> And the reason that, that, I, that I'm going to share this is because you'll see that as you goad, this kind of gives. It moves you along. If it's just a straight stick and it's just a poke, that's not good for anybody. That's not good for the cattle and it's not good for you. Okay? So, go ahead and give me the Lamed. See? Now, put it up here so they can see Okay, so as, as she pushes me forward, you can see it bend a little bit. Okay, and that just kind of moves you forward. And that's, and that's what it is. That's how it works. Thank you, dear. And let me just say this. Ladies, you have to use the Lamed to, 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 to encourage um, and to kind of encourage, uh, urge them forward. Don't use a stick because that's not called... That's not called a biblical goading. That's called nagging, okay? You don't want to nag your husband. That's like sticking him with a stick. Does everybody understand? I know all you men out there understand what I'm saying, okay? But that's the difference, okay? Women are supposed to urge us forward. They're, they're supposed to do the, the Lamed type of goading to sometimes get men to move in certain directions that the family needs, that she sees that he doesn't, okay? So that's, there's nothing wrong with that. Just make sure it's the Lamed and not a stick. How many of you girls still love me, okay? All right, nobody's raising their hands. <laughs> All the guys raise their hands, but not the late... Come on, the Lord's trying to get it right. He's trying to get us to work together as to be one, amen? Everybody fulfilling the role, but doing it His way. The word lamad, L-A-M-A-D, means study or be accustomed to. Lamad, um, the word for lamad is spelled with a lamad, which means staff of urging forward. A mem, which means water powerful or chaos. And Dalit means a door, a pathway, or enter, if you're going to enter. 
And when you put all them together, it means a shepherd or someone controlling chaos through the door or pathway. In other words, it's just kind of a, a moving in direction, slightly easily moving. Okay? The lament of urging forward. Be sure that your heart is bent toward the Lord like the shofar. Okay? You got the shofar here and it's bent. And so you want it, your heart needs to be bent before the Lord because when he goads you then, it's easier for you to go forward. Okay? This is what it's all about. You don't have to be perfect, but we have to. Hear me. We have to have a heart that is bent toward the Lord because if we need correction, then he can goad us in that direction gently, softly by the Spirit, and he will use his prophetic word, personal prophecy to do that so that we can be edified, we can be exhorted, and we can be comforted and ultimately change from glory to glory into his image. Is that right? Yeah. Now, I've got some questions and answers, but I am so far out of time that we're just going to have to save that for another time. I might even do a, a whole session on some of these uh, questions that people have sent in, okay? And so send them in. I promise that I will answer as many as I possibly can, but we'll get to some of these next week, even if we have to go an extra week on this teaching, okay? Praise the Lord. Everybody good? Hearts and spirits clear? Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we ask you to help us now. I know there's a lot that was offered here. And Father, we ask you to help us to write it on our hearts, to go back and listen to this again. And that, Father, you would show us, Lord, how to hear your voice, how to recognize your voice. Because I know that there are people out there that have been listening to this, saying that, well, God speaks to me like that a lot. But I've never really known what it was or how to, what to do with it. Well, Father, I thank you, Lord, that you are giving us understanding so that when you speak to us, Lord, that you, we can be a vessel, an instrument in your hand to bring edification, comfort, and, and exhortation to your people that, Father, they might come to know you more, finding your will, your word, through your word, according to your way, Bless you, and we thank you for it now. In Yeshua's name, and all God's people said, Amen. So we just release that on you. And we pray that as you go out this week, that you seek the Lord for prophetic words, and that he gives you the wisdom on how to minister it so that you can bring life, and you can bring truth, and you can bring comfort to God's people, but also even people that do not know the Lord that you might be an instrument to bring them to the Lord and prophecy can be used properly and in accordance with God. Thank you for joining us. Join us next week. We're going to talk about the way of prophecy next week. That's really, really good. And until then, I just want to say this is Pastor Norm Franz at Ascension Ministries and the team here saying Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>